Welcome everyone to uh, another bright sunny afternoon on Thursday as Volunteer MBC takes on COVID-19 with the Versus COVID-19 Forum. Uh, our topic for today is going to be sustaining fund development efforts. And I think uh, despite everything that we have done, we've, uh, the social purpose sector has done a marvelous job in pivoting and making sure that the community services do uh, go on without any disruption. And that's a remarkable effort. So a few bit of uh, uh, ground rules for today as we engage in the forum. This session is recorded and the recording will be shared via our Co versus COVID-19 web page. And when you want to engage with us, please use the chat box. If you hover over your screen and right to the bottom center, you will see a bar opening up and with the word bubble, that is where you can access the chat box. And in the same bar, you will also have the mute and unmute button of the mic. Uh, we appreciate if you can stay muted while the presentation is going on. And this forum is about uh, having mainly having peer-to-peer -peer discussion. So towards the end, we will open up the forum and you can unmute and join us uh, with, in discussion. And when you introduce yourself, please do, uh, of course, say, say your name, but also the organization you're from. So we know uh, who you are and how we can best answer your questions. Uh, joining us through the web camera is optional. Uh, you can uh, show yourself, which would be a bonus for us to see who you are, but also it's an optional feature. And also, if we finish the forum early, that is OK, because our primary purpose today is to make sure that we have as much insight from our presenter and to help you answer your questions, whatever that need is. Our agenda for today is where uh, we are going through the welcome and up next will be my colleague Shah Nabasi, who will share some updates from Volunteer MBC. And we welcome our presenter uh, Rohit Mehta with the sustaining fund development uh, topic and to share his insights and expertise. Our forum today, the chat box is moderated by my colleague, our Director of Operations, Marina Campus, and Karin will uh, say hi to us at the end and take us through the uh, wrapping up of the forum. So with that, Sean, I'm handing over the updates to you. Hi, everybody. Um, it's Sean Abbasi, and uh, I wanted to say a great hello to everyone who's joined us for this great session. Uh, just a few quick things. Uh, so as many of you know, our nomination deadline for the V Oscars has been extended to Sunday. We wanted to give folks the maximum time. Uh, most of the time each year, uh, we, we've been extending it for a few days just when we get an idea that we can afford a couple more days uh, to get uh, organizations to submit. And then definitely in these uh, trying times, we want you to be able to do that and recognize so many outstanding volunteers. You can also recognize groups and individuals and you can recognize um, you know, people who are uh, leaders of volunteers uh, like yourselves, your organization may, may uh, be able to recognize you as well as uh, outstanding board members. So there are definitely you know, a number of uh, fantastic categories. All the links, I'm going to pu uh, place them into the chat so they make it easy for you to click on them and get to them. Uh, and then uh, certainly you can also get your free ticket to attend the V Oscars. Now, another important notice that we'd like to tell you about, uh, we have a quick survey that you know we're really interested in uh, you know, connecting with vol uh, volunteers and providing them more quality of training. So uh, right now we're we're focused on providing them with some education and awareness on how they can support organizations uh, in this new landscape. So uh, by keeping uh, you as leaders of volunteers in the center, we're developing an orientation series and we're looking to your support to develop modules by letting, letting us know through a short survey how you would like volunteers to support your organization, not only about the types of positions you have, but also on the commitment, uh, what types of active engagement or priority areas uh, there are that uh, you know we may not have already captured. So uh, this training is going to be distributed across the GTA in partnership with Volunteer Markham and Volunteer Toronto as part of a joint project, and we need your input for that survey. So the survey link will be placed in the chat as well. And then finally, uh, we have uh, an initiative where we're uh, focused on really capturing 
organizations that are in either recognizing uh, people in the community, they have a reach in the community and they know that certain people in the community are, are um, in need of something or could benefit from a particular service or essential need. And uh, other organizations might have something that they're trying to distrib distribute or get out there as a service that they want to make sure reaches people. So we're, we're playing a, a role to try to map out that supply and demand uh, and uh, be able to to help respond to that need, and that's an uh, initiative, uh, you know, funded by by the United Way uh, Emergency Community Support Fund. So we are very appreciative of of uh, that uh, funding, so that we can be able to take on this work right now, and make it so that if you're already involved with essential needs, why not make sure that it's uh, as efficient and and strong as possible? So that's what we're trying to do. So I'll put all the links into the chat box in a moment, and and I'm hopeful that uh, you'll be able to engage with us and, and your continued support on these things are is really appreciated. Thank you very much, Sean. And uh, with that, we come to our key presentation today. And please allow me to introduce Roit Mehta, the founder and uh, founder of Do Good uh, Fundraising Solutions. Um, we know Volunteer MBC knows Rohit since his time uh, as a volunteer with Volunteer MBC during, the, uh, during his uh, high school years. And we've seen him grow and the amount of experience that he's gained on the area of uh, diversified fund development is very impressive. And um, you have the bullet points of you know, his credentials here, but something that I'd really like to highlight today uh, is that He's been on the other side of uh, fund development as well, not only in finding those opportunities for uh, organizations, but also for over seven years, he's been in uh, various uh, fund, uh, grants evaluation uh, boards and roundtables. So that bring, gives us a good perspective from his side, where he's able to also speak to us about what our funders looking for. Uh, as part of our evaluation committee member. So that is the valuable uh, expertise and insight that he's going to bring to us today. And with that, Rohit, I'm going to go off this slide and hand over the session to you. Thanks very much, Shaminda. I'm just going to get my presentation going here and um, just allow me a moment to share my screen with everyone. Thanks everyone for joining the session. I hope you can me loud and clear. Um, and, and again, any any comments or questions that come up, please don't hesitate to share it uh, in the chat as we go, and I'll do my best to address them. Um, and I believe we have until 12.30 um, for the presentation portion. Can you confirm, Shaminda? Yes, right. Thanks. So folks, um, let's get right into it. My company, Do Good Fundraising Solutions, provides three services, all-inclusive grant writing, prospect research, uh, which is where we find grants and professional development training, very similar to what we're doing today, with the goal of raising more money for your work. In this presentation, I'm going to share uh, a few things. Uh, first, we'll start by discussing how you can sustain the fund development effort in this new operating environment um, during COVID and after COVID. Number two, I'll talk about how you can research um, and take advantage of grant opportunities that are there right now. This includes emergency funds um, and, and ongoing uh, grants from foundations, corporations, charities. Number three, we'll talk about collective impact. So I'll tell you a bit more about collective impact and how you can take advantage of this method um, to build credibility among funders and supporters. And number four, we'll talk about writing an effective proposal uh, or grant application that is in line with what the funder expects. Um, and so this is what we'll cover in the presentation today. Let's talk about sustaining the fund de development effort in this new operating environment. I'm a huge believer that marketing and communications is one of the best ways to promote your work, but also to communicate it uh, to all of your audiences. And so the first piece of advice I'll give is to always post frequently on social media platforms. Um, so many people are using Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and I encourage every organization on the call to make sure that you are using these channels. They're mostly free, 
um, and that you're taking advantage of posting uh, during optimal times. And, and many times you can find this information within the platforms. Uh, they offer some reports. And so by posting frequently, you're going to be able to let everyone know what you're doing uh, as an organization in, in the new operating environment um, and, and how you're making a difference. I also think it's so important to keep sending regular updates because in fundraising, you need to remain top of mind. So your donors, your supporters, many of them will be subscribed to either your newsletter or perhaps you have an email listserv that, that your supporters subscribe to. They are hoping and waiting for these updates. So organizations who are doing a good job will frequently send updates from the field, um, updates on activities. If an event has gone digital, they'll share that. Uh, but it's important that if you want to continue to engage these stakeholders from a fundraising perspective, that they feel that they're being kept up to date on your activities. Again, from a marketing and communication standpoint, I think you can very frequently, uh, and you should very frequently, profile your supporters, whether they make a donation of, of funds or whether they make a donation of goods or even services. If it's public and and, and if they've welcomed you to share that uh, on the internet and on social media, uh, your newsletter, really all channels, you, then you should. And you should do it um, as soon as you can. Uh, and the reason why is not only does this encourage other people to give, but again, it shows that you're active. And I think at this time, um, all of us are competing for donor dollars. The groups that show that they're active and engaged are the ones that will be funded. Uh, if you're very quiet and, and you don't have much happening on social media or online, chances are you won't catch the attention of your donors. I also think urgency leads to giving. And so I want to encourage you to focus on your highest priority needs. I remember one of my clients, a food bank, uh, put out some social media messaging saying that they really needed rice uh, you know, at a certain time where, where this, the supplies were low. And I just remember what an impact that had on me being able to see that urgent message. And the next time I was at the store, I was able to pick up a donation because I remembered. And, and I believe it did even have the word urgent in it. Um, and so when you can pinpoint or, or um, you know, highlight a priority need, it will often lead to more giving uh, from your supporters and donors. Now on the donor engagement and funder engagement side, um, one thing is that making a donation has to be simple. So about two weeks ago, I received an email from an organization and I, I decided, okay, let me support them. And I was on my phone going for a walk and it was actually a little bit difficult to make that donation. Um, I ended up accidentally making the donation twice because the um, pathway from the email on my cell phone to a website and then all the things I had to click on the website, it was confusing. And um, it, let's just say it wasn't simple. That's not such a great experience. On the other hand, I've had an experience where I clicked twice to make a donation. Um, I remember being really happy about that. And, and everybody wants to support certain causes, but the process of how you support, the pathway to support, actually makes an impact on whether you will give again. The other thing is about tax receipts. Uh, because I've worked in the charitable sector, I know that many donors want their tax receipts quickly. And although it's not required by law to issue a receipt right away, the organization actually has until the end of the year, I encourage you to issue your tax receipts fast. And I think the reason why is because we are competing against donor dollars. You know, people still have money and they still want to give uh, during these challenging times. But I think that those organizations that provide the receipt quickly and put a thank you note, um, that's going to trigger the donor's sense of contribution. They're going to feel more hopeful. They're going to probably feel really good about their donation. Um, and when, when they receive that note, whether it's by email or even in the mail, they're probably thinking about their next donation. Now, if you're not a charity and you can't issue tax receipts, a personalized thank you note goes a long way. So I think this is really important when it comes to sustaining the fund development effort. The other thing is that you should communicate with your donors. 
there's this sense of confusion in the charitable sector about whether we should be calling and reaching out to our donors or is it too pushy. My personal opinion is that you should call your donors and you should also call your funders um, or at least correspond with them and let them know about your high priority needs. It's essential that everybody be kept up to date on what it is the organization needs, whether it's funds for programs, uh, in-kind donations such as food for food banks um, or other needs. And if you put it out there, very often your supporters will take note and they'll, they'll probably want to try and help. And most importantly, I think that all messaging has to be positive and hopeful. There's really no room for negativity um, when it comes to engaging donors and funders. It is a feel-good type of work to make a donation or to make a contribution. And so please make sure that you frame everything as positive and hopeful um, so that you encourage more people to give. Let's talk about how to research these opportunities and how to leverage them for your own organization. When it comes to conducting research, um, you have a lot of places to go. You can start with social media. Uh, and I will say that uh, my company, Social Media Do Good Fund, aims to put out really good content uh, when it comes to grant opportunities. It's localized. You know, if you're in Mississauga, Brampton, Caledon, most of the opportunities pertain to you. There's also newsletters uh, that are provided uh, online. I've written the Ontario Nonprofit Network here. I think it's a fantastic resource. Um, whenever I get it, I always make sure I go through it because there are many grant opportunities. Um, and so I think everyone on this call should subscribe uh, to that newsletter. But beyond that, even a simple Google search can help. You know, so let's say, for instance, you're operating a shelter and you look for shelter grant opportunities. Or if your shelter is in Brampton, shelter grants and Brampton. That can be a great way to utilize a free resource like Google to find grant opportunities very quickly. I also think that when a funding opportunity comes out, people get very excited. And I get a lot of calls and people say, hey, Rohit, are we uh, eligible for this grant? And what I usually do is I get an understanding of what they're doing and, and I'll compare it to the um, guidelines of the funder and, and, and see if that project would match. But if there's any confusion, I get in touch with funders. And I think you should too. Um, maybe send them an email first, You know, a, a short email to say, dear funder, I have this quick question. Um, you know, we're organizing this activity. Is it in line with your priorities? But sometimes you may even choose to call. And I recommend you do all of this first. Before you get excited and start working on the grant application, talk about your project because you need to make sure that it is a strong fit for that funder. It can be a loss of time to actually work on a grant application, let it get submitted and then get declined you know, the, the best thing to do is to actually start by making sure that your project is 100% aligned with that funder and their priorities, and then put in the effort of authoring the grant application and, and making the pitch. I also think that each funding opportunity should be discussed as a whole team. Um, so particularly with decision makers, senior management, uh, your executive director, the board, um, funding opportunities, should be pursued carefully and, and maybe slowly, so, so not, not rushing. Um, and by doing so, number one, you'll make sure that the funder's focus or priorities actually relate to your work. Okay, and this is the best way to leverage grant opportunities because the funders want to fund one particular thing and you're doing another thing and, and you need to make sure there's alignment. But the other piece here is that it's a great opportunity for the team to learn. So many staff don't often get a chance to engage in fundraising work. And I think you really have to take advantage of this process where you get together as a team and say, okay, is this grant for us? And, and what the funder is looking to fund, is that the type of work we're doing? And, and if it's not immediately obvious, is there a way that our work fits within their priorities? And if not, you know, let's get in touch with the funder. These are the types of conversations that should be taking place. And when you have a, an idea or a project or a submission, 
that is going to align strongly, then your chances of success are stronger. I also think that fundraising uh, and, and grant writing should take a, an approach where multiple funders can actually contribute to a project. So for instance, there's an arts organization that I'm working with and they're going to be uh, designing an, an online system and there's going to be a hiring associated with it and a few other pieces. And so one funder is paying for the system. They're paying for a vendor to create the online system. Another funder is paying for the hiring of, of a particular staff member to facilitate all that work. And then we're approaching a, a third funder to pay for a few other aspects. So it's interesting that multiple grants can actually contribute to your recovery, that you don't have to re rely on just one grant opportunity. Um, you can leverage multiple grant opportunities in order to recover from the pandemic. So let's talk about current grant opportunities. I've just highlighted a handful, um, and these should be eligible for most, most people on the call. The Resilient Communities Fund is uh, a one-time grant offered by the Ontario Trillium Foundation. Uh, and it really is about supporting the impacts of COVID um, and, and really getting back to business. And so in this grant, you have to have experienced disruptions to your operations and service delivery. And this is essential because um, there's, there's actually a question that asks specifically what disruptions have you experienced? Please outline them. And it's a part of your assessment. And then another part of the assessment is, is based on the objectives of the grant and how well you align. Um, but this grant is all about rebuilding capacity. It funds things like renovations, equipment, uh, supplies, consultants, trainers. And so there's $5,000 to $150,000 available for up to one year. And I think that the September 2nd deadline, you know, if you're starting today, that's really tight. But um, I think that if, if individuals on the call are considering applying for the grant, I, I really think you should um, go through that process, determine if it's for you, and see if you can submit an application. Um, it's always better to apply earlier when there's a grant like this because the second deadline, there's no guarantee that a lot of the funds um, will be allocated the same way as the first time. Plus, when you apply for the, the first deadline, which is September 2nd, um, if you have the uh, misfortune of, of being declined, you can actually apply again for December 2nd. Only, only one grant per um, applicant will be awarded. Here's some opportunity from the Community Foundation in Mississauga. And when I was preparing this presentation, I checked again, there, there is no deadline. Um, so their emergency relief fund uh, provides up to $5,000 for charities who need to distribute emergency assistance funds um, in order to support um, their response to COVID-19. And so for any charities who are in urgent need of support, um, the grant is quite broad, it, it's quite open. Um, there, there's not a lot of requirements. Um, and so I encourage you to, to visit their website and see if this is something that you can apply for if it helps. And if you're not a charity, you can't uh, apply for this grant. Now I'm going to share three region of Peel grants, uh, a, a very short timeline. Um, it's coming up in about two weeks. So this is new funding um, and, and their whole streams have been revised, mostly in, in light of COVID. So these grants, I think they were actually set to close back in May and then everything was changed. They, they closed them all. They said, we're going back to the table. And so this is really a direct response to COVID, their, their emergency grants. And um, the small capital fund here up to $10,000 it's really about helping with core operating costs and small capital costs. So, um, you know, small equipment um, under 10,000, um, you know, maybe there's a, a, a renovation you have to do um, perhaps to, to make your services more um, accessible or, or to adapt to COVID. 
Um, so this is one of those grants where you really want to go through the guidelines and make sure you're eligible. And if not, you can always reach out to the Region of Peel um, Community Investment Program, and you can find that contact information on their website. So the Change Fund is a bit of a bigger grant, um, closes again in, in about two weeks, and it's all about responding to local community issues. Um, so there are two streams, Connect and Convene. Uh, Connect is about executing some sort of a small scale event or project um, that should say in response to an immediate need. And the Convene stream is about implementing a one year initiative in response to a localized need. So whether you're sort of a grassroots group that's just getting started, um, uh, it could be a grassroots collaborative, um, or whether you're a, a, a larger collaborative partnership, um, it does require collaboration. And the idea is that when nonprofit groups work together, they can address community needs better than if one organization works on its own. So, so the whole goal here is to try and create some sort of change at the community level. They'll provide up to $50,000 for one year. And um, the region does want organizations to work together. Of course, they want the sector to be stronger together. Uh, and so if you have questions about this, you know, I'm, I'm a resource. You can always reach out to me through Volunteer MBC or um, get in touch with the region of Peel and, and certainly ask those questions sooner than later. Now, the capacity fund is a bit of a different one, um, also known as organizational effectiveness. Some folks on the call may have applied in the past. So it's all about structures within the organization itself. So you can um, focus on one of three priorities that are related to COVID. Number one, support adaptive models of service delivery. So how you deliver services to your um, audience, to your, your um, clients. And that has to be directly as a result of COVID. So maybe, you know, before you were offering workshops in person, now you're doing it online. Before you had a storefront, now it's delivery. Number two, the second priority uh, for the capacity fund is capacity building tools to help you adapt. This is quite broad and, and, and maybe a bit vague. Um, and so the guidelines do give you more information, but uh, a capacity building tool could be a database. Um, where you contain certain information could be access to online training. Maybe maybe your organizations need to understand how to access health and safety guidelines, and, and you don't have that training. Um, and so and so it's really up to um, you as an organization to determine what tools you need, and then you should check with the region of Peel if they would fund that before you start. And number three, um, addressing systemic discrimination. So there's a little bit more information there that you can find on the website. But the bottom line is it's up to $30,000. And again, that deadline is September 4th. Let's switch gears and talk about collective impact. Um, so collective impact is essentially collaboration, which brings together different sectors to solve a complex community problem or a complex issue. So I took some of these points from the Tamarack Institute. They are a leader in collective impact and collective impact thinking. What they say is when you're starting collective impact, when you're forming a collaboration that will solve a large problem, you need to start by understanding and determining the desired impact. What is the change that we're trying to create? You should list out the activities that are required to actually achieve that change. This is called a theory of change. You should gather all sorts of data and research to support the action that you're going to take and also to justify the work that you're doing. There usually needs to be some statistics to prove that this is an issue. You know, for example, young people do need um, additional support now that a lot of them are not in school. Or for instance, entrepreneurs do need support now that many of them are not um, earning the same revenue as before. So you need data to support that claim. Okay, number four, to map out your stakeholders. So find out everyone who's touched by this issue and everyone who should be at the table in order to achieve that impact. And then begin engaging them. 
put out those those calls and those emails to let them know that you're building a collective impact um, project and that you want them involved. And finally, that's when you begin the grant process. So when you collaborate with a number of organizations, maybe some of your colleagues on this call, maybe other volunteer MBC members, you can then bring in more funds than you could as a single organization on your own. So I do encourage collective impact thinking. Volunteer MBC is very much involved in collective impact. Um, and so they're a great resource to speak with. You know, there's some collaborations that, that we've helped with as well. Um, so please do get in touch if, if you have questions about this. And I think I'll, I'll just end by talking a little bit about an effective project proposal. And so when you're writing a proposal, especially in, in this sort of COVID um, environment, I want you to always focus on the need or the, the evidence base for that need um, when you're applying for funding. So one thing you need to do is you need to describe the impact that COVID has had on your organization. Um, you should provide some sort of justification, whether you've done a survey or, or something, to prove that this is an actual impact. You always need to express a sense of urgency. So in the same way that we use urgency to encourage donors to give, you also need to use urgency to encourage funders to give. Um, and, and certainly as a past grant review team member with the Ontario Trillium Foundation, I remember seeing applicants, uh, there was an applicant one time, uh, th their roof was about to cave in. And so when they highlighted this in their application, we had to give them funding. And in this case, if you have very vulnerable clients who are falling through the cracks, or if you have uh, a key support that you are providing to the community that you can't anymore, you need to express that. And, and like I said, demonstrate that it's a true need, use data, use statistics, prove to the funder that you know that this is important and that you have facts to support it and that they need to get behind you. When it comes to writing an effective proposal, you have to also quantify the impact. So not just we're going to make a difference in the lives of youth or we're going to help um, you know, improve the lives of individuals in a shelter, but but talk about numbers. Talk about um, you know for youth what what type of impact they're going to see maybe in their letter grades. Maybe young people who go through our program will see a ten percent jump in their grades, right? So quantify that impact and then outline how you will evaluate it. How do you know that you've actually achieved that impact? And finally, always speak in the funder's language. It's not good to use jargon, but once in a while when funders keep using jargon um, that's specific to a grant, you should probably refer to that because they're looking for that. So for instance, if they keep talking about youth engagement, make sure you talk about youth engagement, right? Try not to use different words um, and, and make sure that you align strongly with their priorities so that when they see your grant, they say, ah, yes, this, this applicant has looked at our priorities, understood them they're a perfect fit for our grant. Okay, so that's about it from my side. Um, I'll turn it back to the team at Volunteer NBC and we'll, we'll open it up for questions. Hi Rohit, this is Marina. We have uh, one question in the chat box and it comes from Karine. She says, what about applying to companies where you have no one you can reach out to to discuss your request? So I just captured part of the question there at the end, it went blank. Um, so all I heard was if there's no one you can reach to discuss your request, what was the first part? Yes, um, you have no one to reach out to, to discuss your request. So you want to apply to a company, I believe, and uh, they have an opportunity, but you don't have any ins there. Am I right, Karine? Sorry, yes, that's correct. Yeah, I, I think that's a great, question sort of how do you how do you enter um, a funder or an organization where you don't know anyone so one of the places I, I recommend that my clients go is to the board of directors um, because I think the job of a board of directors is to be very well connected and to to leverage their connections for the organization um, so when I've sat on boards we have asked hey does anyone know someone who works at Rogers who works at Scotiabank and that can be a way to get in. But at the same time, 
many of these corporations are places of business. So even if it was enterprise rent a car, you can just walk in and have a quick chat with the employee and ask if you can be in touch with their manager. That's a great way to kind of get a foot in the door. And this is really specific to corporate grants because foundation funds are usually very open um, and very transparent, uh, as well as government grants. Corporate are the ones I find where they want you to know someone there. And, and so you really have to network. I hope that helps. Uh, thanks, uh, Rohit. Um, Karine, do you have something else? Uh, yes, sorry, I'm I'm typing away here, but how long okay. should you wait when you have applied to a foundation for emergency funding before you start to nudge them? Okay, so many foundations are very clear, especially at this time, about the turnaround time because they, they actually don't want anybody to nudge them. Um, you know, a lot of them are are already inundated with requests. Uh, when they put out a grant call, uh, many times uh, they're spending time reviewing those applications, discussing them. They're busy. If they haven't written a timeline, if they haven't said, you know, we'll get back to you within two weeks, three weeks, a month, I I've even seen three months, um, you should email them. So if there is no timeline, you should email them and ask for the timeline. But I, I think they have to provide a timeline. If they haven't provided one, that is the next step to take, to ask them, what's your timeline? And then, of course, once that timeline is passed, you can send a friendly follow-up message to say, hey, you know, your website says two weeks. It's been two weeks. We're just wondering if you received our application and, um, you know, if any decision has been made. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's another, I think here, uh, Sylvia's, Sylvia's looking for a tip from you. Uh, many corporations are notorious for having online forms only with no direct people contacts. Many okay, corporations so I'm gonna interpret are notorious. The, yeah, yeah, I'm going to interpret the question there. So I think you're asking if they only have an online form to contact them, how do we get in touch? And this is where a good fundraising professional helps. So I subscribe to databases. I pay for databases in order to get that contact information. Many corporations have actually left that out on purpose because they don't want people contacting them. Um, and, and quite honestly, many corporations want to decide themselves who they're going to give to. Um, you know, General Mills may give to food related um, programs. Uh, Nike may give to sports. But I think what you need to focus on in, in that process is to use that contact us button to let them know why you're contacting them. So you can say, I have a donation inquiry. I'd like to get in touch with someone. You can say, um, I'm trying to reach someone in marketing because we want to partner with your company on a marketing effort. Um, you can say that you're looking for sponsorship. Like somebody will get back to you eventually. Um, but you know, it's interesting. We have so much social media now and, and don't be shy about reaching out to them on social media. They might get back to you faster. Um, and, and don't lie, you know, be honest about why you're reaching out and say, we're looking for uh, sponsorship or we're looking to submit a donation request. Most corporations have processes around this. And if you're really struggling, please get in touch with me through Volunteer MBC. I, I should be able to help. And we invite everyone else on the forum as well. You could uh, either type into the chat box or you could uh, unmute yourself and uh, sp uh, speak to Rohit directly through the uh, to the microphone. Rohit. Um, until others join in, uh, a question from me is, uh, you know, right now, because of the effort that we are, the social purpose sector is putting into, uh, you know, to pivot to the in response to COVID and also when everything is gradually moving back to what is going to be a new normal. Um, the work, I'm pretty sure the workloads of uh, leaders of volunteers, the program managers, the executive directors uh, themselves, and maybe if they still have their fund development office or whatever that position title is. Um, how should the uh, entire organization, uh, you know, rally together to sort of, uh, 
you know, apply for these grants? It's a good question. I think the first thing you have to do as an organization, once you've made that decision that you want to go ahead and, and apply for a grant, um, you have to let leadership know that, okay, we're going to be go ahead, we're going to go ahead and we're going to apply. If it's a foundation, um, you put an application together, you collaborate on the application and you submit it. If it's a corporation, um, you might want to take a bit of a different approach where you put together a proposal, you submit it, and then you can have one or two members of the team actually reach out to their contact at the company and let them know that you've put in a proposal. So if I've captured your question correctly, I mean, that's one way to, to strategize around the grant. Maybe you're asking a little bit different. Did I, did I get that right? Uh, uh, yes, uh, to an extent, Rohit. And I'm also sort of thinking of, you know, uh, who should that grant writing be uh, the responsibility of? Gotcha. I think that when you're working on an application, one individual has to take the lead on grant writing. And it really doesn't have to be the job of a paid fundraising member of your team. It can actually be any one member of your team who takes the lead. Um, I think it's important when you write a grant that you're speaking with one voice. So it can be very obvious when multiple people have edited a grant application and it doesn't read um, succinctly kind of as one grant application. Um, but at the same time, I think it's important that all staff, including frontline staff who are impacted by a grant, that they have a voice in that application, that they contribute to the proposal because the impact of the grant is going to affect them and their work, right? So I think the best way to do this is to come together as a team early on, say, okay, we've identified this grant. Um, you know, the team decides what kind of strategy you're pitching and putting forward, and then get on a Google Doc and use Google Docs. Um, I use it all the time in my work. It's free, uh, it's collaborative, it's pretty easy to use. Um, and you should put all the questions there in the document and have everyone contribute to it. And if, if the frontline worker, for instance, sees somewhere where they say, well, you know, the timeline here isn't really realistic, then add that comment and say, hey, is there any way we can, you know, look at this timeline and adjust? Or maybe if senior management is looking at the budget and they're saying, well, you know, this isn't how much it costs to actually hire a staff. We need to bump this up or add benefits. Then they can add those pieces and everybody else can see that. Um, so it is very democratic, but it's also very collaborative. I, I hope that that helps. That's that's one approach. Yes, it does. Uh, Marina, do we have any more questions on the chat? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Um, so this one comes from Lauren. And Lauren's asking, Hi, hello, Rohit. Thank you for presenting. Lots of great information. Does your company also offer grant reporting? How do you recommend preparing for grant reporting? Right, so thanks, Lauren. It's something I've been asked a number of times. Um, we we haven't done it. We haven't done reports for um, our clients yet. I might be open to it on a case by case basis, depending on how involved the reporting is. Um, only because we we really focus on finding grants, um, you know, jumping in and, and and writing them. And I and I would never want our time to be blocked off you know, on, on reports. Um, we, we really try to be nimble and try and find grants for the sector um, and then to act on those short-term opportunities. Um, I think the other part of your question, I missed it. So you asked kind of, do we do reporting? My answer is really no. Um, what was the other part of the question? Uh, how do you recommend preparing for grant reporting? Yeah, so not last minute. Um, which is what so many people do in nonprofit because we're so busy, right? We have so much on our plates. Um, and so many people see that report deadline and they think, okay, my report's due in August. I'll start working on that in August. And you shouldn't. What you should be doing is um, it's, it's a good project management principle to always have your outcomes and objectives kind of right on your desk uh, throughout the year. And when you do a check-in with your manager, you should be reporting on those objectives. So for instance, let's say we're running a youth program. It's a youth tutoring program through Zoom. 
And the program has just been given a one-year grant. And next August, we have to tell the funder how we've been able to help these young people improve their grades by 10% um, within the communities of Malton and Cooksville. Okay. So as I'm, let's say I'm, I'm the frontline worker and I'm doing this work in Malton and Cooksville, every week or every month, I should be reporting on those outcomes and saying, okay, well, how many youth do we help this month, for instance? Um, and, and do we have a benchmark for their letter grades, right? Let's say we have those letter grades in, a, in an Excel document or somewhere. Can we access even their midterm report cards? You know, and this is, this is just an example, so just follow along. Can we access their midterm report cards and get those letter grades, their averages, and see if there's been a jump? Once we can do that, let's put a check mark next to that individual and say, okay, here we've been able to achieve one of those outcomes. Let's go a step further. Instead of just saying, yes, youth achieved outcome check mark, why don't we also add a comment? This youth, um, you know, I don't know, uh, Mike uh, achieved a 10% jump in his letter grades. He indicated that the program has helped him in his confidence and helped him with time management. You have that information in a spreadsheet, you can leave it there and keep doing your good work uh, on the front lines. When it comes time to write the report, you have all the data, you have all the comments, you just need to take a few hours and put it together. Um, that's how reporting should be done, not you know, 15 or 20 hours of report writing up you know, until 1 a.m. as many people do right before the deadline. That's, a, that's not recommended. Always plan ahead and always collect your data throughout the year um, so that when reporting time comes, it's, it's a matter of reformatting and sending it off to the funders. Marina, to interject before the next question and on the same topic, Rohit, when it comes to the quantifiable and the qualitative uh, reporting, um, you know, formats, uh, how much does the funders value? Uh, I'm typing into your, you know, the, the fundraising side of it. How much does the funders value the storytelling angle of uh, in the reports as a, in comparison to the, the, uh, the numbers itself? Yeah. Well, every funder looks at the numbers and, and that's very standard. And based on the numbers, they're going to tell you whether you achieved your target or not. And they're, they're probably going to base the next grant on that. The storytelling is what sets you apart as an applicant. Most applicants don't tell stories. Um, storytelling is probably one of the most important parts of grant writing and therefore one of the most important parts of reporting on those grants. Not just what impact did we make, but let's look at specific individuals whose lives were changed. If you can do a good job on that, not only is your funder going to remember you, but next time you apply for a grant, they're probably going to excitedly recommend you. Um, storytelling can also be used when things don't go well. So you can explain why you didn't achieve your targets, but you can also outline some of the great work that was done by the program. Um, Success isn't all, all about numbers. You know, just because you said you were going to change the lives of 100 youth and you only helped change the lives of 90 youth, I mean, you still had a significant impact. If you can tell the story of those youth and show how you met the funder's objective, that may be a success in their eyes, uh, even if you didn't hit your quantitative target. So I think going back to this question about quantitative and qualitative and sort of what's the use of storytelling, you have to go beyond the numbers and talk about people's lives and the impact your work has had, not just during COVID, but at all times. Um, and uh, there are funders that will recognize this. Like Ontario Trillium used to have a great grant award that they would give out to an organization that actually demonstrates not just, you know, targets, but also truly creating a healthy and vibrant, uh, a healthy and vibrant Ontario. Um, and so that was directly as a result of, of storytelling and being able to tell that story effectively. Becky, Mara. All right, thank you. Uh, so Sean, Sean asks, with many organizations applying for similar types of projects during the recovery period, how important a factor is uniqueness and innovation yeah. Or should organizations stick to tried, true interventions? It, it is all about innovation. Many times we're at the strategy table and we are 
talking about ideas that organizations are putting forward um, before it goes to the funder. If you're doing the same mentorship program that everybody has been doing for years, I mean, it, it's, it's so overdone, you know, we're going to do mentorship, right? That is not innovative. And if 15 applicants come to the table and all of them have a mentorship program, um, nobody's going to stand out. But if you've all of a sudden decided to use uh, a mobile app to engage young teens, um, you know, in, in helping to improve, for instance, uh, you know, again, their academic performance, not just through mentorship, but also through um, having an app that does check-ins with them, and and maybe um, maybe the fact that they're always on technology, and and you know you're now incorporating the technology, um, it, it's something innovative, it's something unique, that's going to stand out for sure. And I can speak to Trillium because when I joined Trillium, they weren't all about innovation but but at a certain point the foundation said let's start investing in innovative new ideas um and i think that's very powerful when foundations do that and usually what trillium does many organizations follow because it is the largest funder of nonprofit work um nonprofit community work in canada and so don't just stick to things that are t tried and tested everything has changed you know we're such a technological society now where um, people of all ages are on Zoom. You know, most shopping is being done online. Everybody has a cell phone in their hands, right? So, so you you have to you have to operate in the year two thousand twenty, and and you have to be innovative. And and by that I mean make sure you're incorporating technology. Make sure you're recognizing your demographic and and how they engage and interact. Um, yeah, I, I hope that helps. Thanks, Rohit. Um, uh, one more question from Karine. If your organization has a high focus on events to raise funds, can that be cited as a significant negative impact to continue to run your operation? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and we see this with a lot of our clients. So there are organizations like Volunteer MDC um, who've done a great job of raising money uh, and fund development has been a big part of their work. Now that we're in this crisis and, and many organizations are not allowed to put on those events, you know, um, walkathons, golf tournaments, galas, these are things that are actually largely prohibited at this time. That's a pretty significant um, revenue um, source that has now been essentially eliminated. And so, and so when you're applying to funders, you have to paint the picture and say, look, here's how much revenue we were getting beforehand. Here's how much we're getting now. That was all special events. We used to, you know, we used to really specialize in that. We need help at this point. The funder is going to understand when you paint that picture and you show them your numbers and you talk about the impact that that had on your work, right? Because those special events are not just for money. They're also for volunteer engagement and um, engaging stakeholders and, and, and getting you know, getting people together uh, to to engage with your organization. Um, once you're not able to do those events, you have to tell the funder uh, exactly what an impact that has had, and then you have to propose something um, reasonable and and re and realistic to replace that impact. So, if you've lost fifty thousand in revenue, um, but now you come up with a social enterprise that's going to um, maybe sell. Um, some sort of intellectual uh, knowledge or, or maybe some sort of service that will, will generate those funds. The funder will look at that and say, yep, that's smart. They've lost their events, but now that they've come up with this social enterprise, you know, we should fund that. And they will. Um, if you make a strong case for it, they certainly will. Um, and I think if it wasn't galas and golf tournaments, if it was your um, you know, marathon of hope that you used to run that you can't anymore, um, we do see a lot of third-party event organizers going online now. I think it is a good um, model, but you can still say to your funders, even though we're going online, we're not expecting our marathon of hope to bring in the you know hundred thousand that it did in the past. We need help with that shortfall, um, and funders will listen and they will pay attention as long as you justify you know what happened, what's the what's the uh, shortfall, and how are you going to make up that shortfall through that grant. All right, and the last one is a statement. I'm just going to read it as quickly as possible. Um, it's from Corrine, 
and it's for the benefit of those who can't see the chat box. Mm. Um, this is so uh, what Corinne says. Um, th uh, this is more of a statement that ties in volunteer engagement to obtain CSR corporate support. Many companies, especially banks, all support their staff to donate to to the charity where they volunteer. So, in other words, Green saying that that's one of um, that's one avenue if you can try and get a bit of funds through the CSR, especially yeah, that's for a banks. Great idea, and I think Volunteer MBC has been particularly smart about engaging with organizations like Scotiabank. Uh, every December, we, the organization does an open house. Scotiabank generously matches donations that are made at that event. Um, and Scotiabank brings their volunteers, and it's been an ongoing relationship um, that has truly benefited both Volunteer MDC and Scotia um, because their employees are engaged with the community. They, their name is put out there. They're associated with a good cause. Um, and, so, and so maybe that's one point that even I missed from the presentation is that if you don't have an in with a corporation, you know, maybe go to your local bank and, and say to them, hey, um, we're a nonprofit, we're a charity, we have a board of directors. Is it possible to just chat with the branch manager about maybe having somebody from the bank come and get involved with our board? And many times you'll be surprised that these banks do send their volunteers and their volunteers come with money. So you volunteer, you know, X number of hours and they'll make a donation um, to your organization. So I think it's an awesome point. Yeah. And uh, uh, this another question from Corrine. Which funder would you would support the salary of leaders of volunteers? Mm, that's a tough one. Um, a lot of times funders want to fund programs, right? And, and this is sort of the trend now. They don't want to fund core expenses. And, and many times they look at volunteer management as a core expense because it's not associated with a particular program. It's associated with all. So my secret um, strategy to addressing this is if you realize that you can't get money to have your volunteer coordinator on a permanent salary uh, all year round, what you do is you build projects and you bill part of that volunteer co coordinator's time into the project. So going back to this example about young people and you know, improving their letter grades um, and, and helping them achieve academic excellence, Part of that work is going to involve coordinating some sort of volunteers who will provide that mentorship, they'll provide that leadership. When you submit the grant request, you may ask for a portion of those funds to fund the volunteer manager's salary or the volunteer coordinator's salary. Is it enough to pay their whole salary? No, it's not. And, and I know this mm -hmm. is challenging. And so we need to come up with a way to pay for that expense through a combination of grants, donations, um, and and some revenue from uh, from other sources. I really hope that down the road, funders will see the importance of roles like volunteer managers and volunteer coordinators, um, and and offer to provide funding for that. Um, and at the same time, I'll say that the region of Peel is one funder that stands out as um, maybe understanding the role that that certain staff play. Um, in helping the whole organization achieve its whole impact. And so um, if I was to focus on a particular funder, at least in Peel, um, that might be one uh, that you can speak to about your needs around the volunteer coordinator, and they can probably help you put together um, a grant application which has part of those expenses built in. Um, but unfortunately, there is no you know, funder out there that says we fund volunteer management specifically. I, I've yet to see that. Thanks, Rohit. Over to you, Shaminda. Yep, and with that, we thank uh, uh, Forum Moderator today, Marina Campos. Uh, you, uh, Marina, thank you very much for that. And we hand over the session to Corinne. Thank you very much. Um, it's um, been wonderful having you. I really, really appreciate the information you provided. Um, I do want to mention that um, our presentation will be on our, this presentation will be on the website and on our Versus COVID-19 page. Um, so that will give you access to the webcast and the resources um, that uh, have been provided. 
And um, uh, having, and we also wanted to quickly mention that uh, there's a, a conference, uh, an online, sorry, it's a workshop by uh, volunteer management professionals of Canada. It's an online meeting that's coming up on the 21st. You can still register for that. Um, and then Volunteer Canada has one uh, which is focusing on adapting, delivering and learning, uh, pivoting your virtual volunteer model um, to a virtual volunteer model. So um, again, that's on August 25th from 1 to 2. And uh, you know, I, I think it would be very, very helpful if you could uh, uh, register for that. And I again, I want to thank you. I know we're running over time. Um, I really, really appreciate your time today. And Rohit, thank you so much. This was very, very informative. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of the day. And we'll see you again next week. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye.